Good afternoon. I'm Maureen Quinn, a senior advisor, and I want to welcome um, everyone here today to the International Peace Institute. Uh, today, we're very pleased to host a panel on the Istanbul process on regional security and cooperation for a secure and stable Afghanistan. The Istanbul process brings together Afghanistan and its near and extended neighbors in the heart of Asia. It envisions a better future for the heart of Asia and aims to put that vision into action. Now regionalism is a tricky thing, a tricky thing to build. And here I'm going out of the region, uh, outside of the heart of Asia, and I'm actually quoting the president of Indonesia in a speech he gave earlier this year about regionalism in uh, the Asia Pacific. President Yudo Yono of Indonesia said, regionalism, of course, is a tricky thing to build. It's a, it is about cultivating among governments and peoples a real sense of belonging in a, to a region, a willingness to work together for it. It is not just a diplomatic undertaking. It is an economic, political, and psychological phenomenon. So in the heart of Asia, the Istanbul process is responding to this need for results-oriented regional cooperation. In understanding efforts at regional cooperation, I think there are two questions to consider. What is the process to frame, foster, and carry out the regional political dialogue? And then what's happening on the ground in the implementation of uh, action items? So 10 months after the launch of the Istanbul process, we are very lucky and we have an eminently qualified panel today to address these issues, to provide insights on this new mechanism, and to answer our questions. I'm very pleased to introduce uh, all of our speakers, and I'll introduce them all, and uh, then uh, uh, go into our presentations. And you have your bios, so I'm going to, their bios in your, the handout, so I'll be brief. Anyhow, Ambassador Apican is the permanent representative of Turkey to the United Nations since 2009, and he'll be our first speaker. Ambassador, we very much look forward to learning about Turkey's role in fostering the process and gaining an understanding of how this new process aims to meet the regional challenge of building peace and security in the heart of Asia. Ambassador Apican brings years of diplomatic experience. He has had a distinguished diplomatic career uh, in leadership roles in both the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Turkey and at Turkish missions abroad. Ambassador Tannen is our second speaker. Ambassador Tannen is the permanent representative of Afghanistan to the United Nations since 2006. Prior to becoming ambassadors, the, uh, the ambassador here at the United Nations, Ambassador Tannen was a, a producer and editor at the BBC, and before that, an academic. Ambassador Tannen, we hope you'll share some of the details of the Istanbul process, uh, the, uh, the confidence building, on the confidence building measures, the countries involved, uh, in the process, and your outlook as well on this new uh, approach to regionalism, to regional cooperation. Uh, we are also very pleased we have Dr. Keith Stansky uh, on our panel. Dr. Uh, Stansky is the Senior Program Officer with the Center on International Cooperation at New York University. Uh, Keith very kindly stepped in when Bruce Jones from uh, the Center at NYU was unable to join us today. Uh, Keith works directly on the Afghanistan project at the center and has worked previously in Afghanistan. Uh, he's also consulted with Wilton Park, the Institute for Inclusive Security, among other centers, and he writes regularly on Afghanistan and South Asia. We're looking to Keith to help us understand the process of political dialogue and the context of regional uh, cooperation in South Asia. So uh, thank you all very much. Welcome. And Ambassador Apican, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Quinn, Ambassador Tanin, Dr. Jones, distinguished guests. It's, it, it's indeed a great pleasure to be among this distinguished audience today. I would like to take this opportunity to thank IPI for, for, for the valuable cooperation they are extending to us. It has been an honor uh, and a privilege to work to cooperate with the IPI here. 
We are gathered here today to discuss our perspectives on a topic of great interest to my country. Before going any further, I feel the need to express the exemplary nature of our relations with Afghanistan. Both countries were among the first to recognize each other in the early 1920s, and our historical relations were formalized with the signature of a strategic friendship and cooperation agreement on 1st March 1921. These are the days of uh, Kemal Atatürk and Emanullah Khan. So the friendship was close, interaction between two societies, two nations were friendly and brotherly, and our roots, you know, goes back to those days. We have been, you know, working and cooperating uh, with Afghanistan since 1920s on various sectors and upon various fields. I mean, uh, our people there, Afghan students, Afghan people in Turkey, we have had really a close relationship and cooperation with Afghanistan. We see Afghanistan, although Afghanistan is not a neighbor country to us, but I have to say, we see Afghanistan as a brotherly country. May I say it, sir? Yeah, thank you. So Afghanistan's safety, security, and welfare has always been among our foreign policy priorities. It's our sincere understanding that sustainable peace and stability requires collective solutions to regional issues. Hence, we consider regional cooperation and ownership as an essential element for lasting peace, stability, and prosperity, not only in Afghanistan, but also in the region as a whole. Within this framework, as most of you are well aware, since 2007, we have been organizing trilateral summit this process with our two friendly and brotherly countries, Afghanistan and Pakistan. This has been an important initiative to further enhance trust and open channels of communication between our countries. And during our membership in the Security Council from 2009, to 10, we were cooperating with the Afghan mission here so closely and with the Afghan government. We also served for one year as a coordinator for Afghanistan in the Security Council. Distinguished guests, today with the advent of globalization, regions are regaining their importance as the building blocks of our globalized world. The region which has Afghanistan at its epicenter, lying at the intersection of South Asia, Central Asia, Eurasia, and Middle East, is one of the most crucial regions in our globe. Re renowned 21st century poet Muhammad Iqbal Lahori used the term heart of Asia to denote the strategic location of Afghanistan at the center of Asian continent. This term has been the inspiration behind the Istanbul process, which was launched at the Istanbul Conference for Afghanistan, Security and Cooperation in the Heart of Asia on 2nd November 2011. The Istanbul process recognized Afghanistan's crucial role and regional and historical position in promoting connectivity and cooperation across the heart of Asia region. The Istanbul process is consistent with Afghanistan's vision of achieving lasting stability and prosperity anchored in a regional environment that is stable, economically integrated, and conducive to share prosperity. The unique format launched at the Istanbul Conference, combining Afghan leadership and regional ownership, intended to shape a new vision for regional cooperation. Regional cooperation, as envisaged by the Istanbul process, aims to collectively enhance political dialogue among all heart of Asia countries, 
in a result-oriented and practical framework. Key regional organizations and relevant UN agencies are included in the process to share their valuable experiences and prevent unnecessary duplication of efforts and resources. We cannot comment enough the significant contribution of the United Nations Assistant Mission in Afghanistan, UNAMA. In addition, from the outset, the Istanbul process has enjoyed the support of a large number of countries and organizations from outside the region dubbed as supporters committing themselves to provide support to the process in pursuit of a stable and prosperous region. Istanbul process has three main elements that need to be highlighted. First, enhancing political dialogue among the region. The ministerial level Istanbul conference, the follow-up conference in Kabul, and the regular meetings of our senior officials and ambassadors in Kabul help us enhance our common understanding, coordination, and cohesion on a number of issues of joint interest. As such, Istanbul process has proved that the region has the will and the commitment to produce consensus-based solutions to the common challenges that we face. Within the framework of the 67th General Assembly, there will be a senior official meetings of the Istanbul process on 24 September 2012. Secondly, implementation of confidence-building measures. Heart of Asia countries selected and endorsed seven out of 43 identified confidence-building measures to be initially developed on the principles of consensus and self-differentiation. The implementation of these CBMs will be instrumental in building trust among the heart of Asia countries and in eliminating misconceived perceptions. We believe that this will take the regional cooperation from rhetoric into action. In this spirit, Turkey, which is leading the counter-terrorism CBM alongside Afghanistan and United Arab Emirates, has already organized a technical meeting on September 3rd in Ankara with the participation of all relevant Heart of Asia countries. Thirdly, synergy among regional organizations. Istanbul process aims to complement other regional efforts create greater linkages and produce synergy in Afghanistan-related efforts of regional organization. To that end, we have mapped out existing Afghanistan-related activities and programs, including those undertaken by various regional organizations. We are incorporating them into our work in order to achieve greater coherence. Distinguished guests, our relations with Afghanistan goes beyond any strategic partnership. We feel that Turkey is a, is a, is a strategic and historical partner, a historical partner for the Afghan people. Afghanistan, with its natural resources and human potential, is indeed a country of the future, also a country of the future. And regional dimension has a significant role to play in this promising future that awaits Afghanistan. We believe that domestic political processes in Afghanistan, together with these regional and international initiatives, will produce a strong and prosperous future for the Afghan people. We believe that Afghanistan played this historical role in the region from the very start of the 20th century. They did it, and we believe that in the future, in the near future, they will play the same role. Let me conclude by expressing once again our sincere belief in the success of this process. We are very much encouraged by the region's resolve to work together for a better future. Only together we can overcome these challenges. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Apikhan, for providing us that 
great outline of the background and uh, the vision uh, and the mission. So, Ambassador Tannen, thank you. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Quinn. Uh, I would like to express uh, a warm welcome to fellow colleagues and participants for taking the time to be here today. Uh, and I'm impressed by the, the presence of uh, a great number of colleagues here. I would like to convey our thanks to the entire team at uh, IPI and the mission of Turkey uh, for co-hosting uh, with us today's important discussion. A special thanks go to my esteemed friend uh, and colleague, Ambassador Afakan, and uh, to Kit uh, Stansky of the CIC for joining me in this panel. Uh, Ambassador Apakon has uh, just given us a, not all, only a very useful presentation on the origins of the Istanbul process and its goals and objectives, but he also took us to, uh, to the very rich and background uh, of our historical relations. In modern time, Afghanistan and Turkey has been uh, uh, two close friends. Uh, and as Ambassador Rapakon said, it's going back to 1920s, a year after Afghan uh, full independence, when Turkey was, uh, af after the First uh, World War, was struggling, uh, struggling for uh, reestablish itself as a, as a big nation that we see now. Uh, uh, and on the, on the ashes of an empire that was no longer there. But in such a situation, Turkey played a vital role in, in, in the days state building in Afghanistan and the, build, and, the, and the establishing of a modern state in Afghanistan, whether it was the, the formation of Afghan new army, uh, new state, uh, or drafting our uh, modern laws, training of, of uh, uh, the new cadres of a new government uh, uh, in Afghanistan. And I have to say that in 1920s, uh, first Afghan, for the first time Afghan girls went for education abroad uh, starting from Turkey. So, <clears throat> on uh, the topic we are uh, now here, we speak, I'm trying to be mm, uh, as much informative as I can, rather than uh, to give you big, uh, big thoughts about it. And then, uh, of course, Ambassador Quinn will, will engage us in a, uh, in, in a debate with you if there are questions we can answer. Uh, as uh, it was uh, highlighted, uh, uh, the Istanbul process is a unique uh, endeavor uh, whereby Afghanistan is at the center of a new effort in our wider region, supported by international partners uh, to realize peace and uh, prosperity in Afghanistan uh, the region and beyond. Uh, in fact, it is heart of Asia. Uh, it's not because uh, Iqbal called it, uh, Iqbal Lahuri called it the heart of Asia. It's geographically heart of Asia. It's not only Afghanistan in this heart of Asia, it's where uh, West, South, Central uh, Asia uh, meet together. Uh, so it's a geographical fact, it's, but also it's importantly, it's a geostrategic fact. Uh, and it's, we are also looking to see that as a geoeconomic fact also, and geopolitical fact. So where we can come together and work together. The Istanbul process, uh, uh, in fact, came about from a sense of uh, collective responsibility uh, in the face of many challenges uh, uh, facing the people of our uh, greater region. 
through uh, time and experience, we, will, uh, we all have come to realize in an obvious reality that the challenges of terrorism, extremism, and uh, narcotics threaten uh, the safety and well-being of all our peoples. And that increased the uh, trade in transit and investment in human and uh, natural resources will help improve the lives of all our citizens and help uh, guarantee a more prosperous future for generations to, to come. The confidence building measures, CBMs, to which we committed in Istanbul, uh, uh, provide a, uh, in, in November 2011, when the process started, provide a concrete uh, framework uh, for effective cooperation in a wide area of uh, fields, uh, such as counter terrorism, counter narcotics, disaster management, strengthening links uh, among national uh, chambers of uh, commerce, and educational and cultural cooperation. Another key feature of the process is that it does not seek to replace uh, existing regional efforts, uh, but rather is designed to complement and build up on the work of uh, relevant actors in the region, including uh, regional organizations. In just uh, less than a year, uh, important headway has been made in uh, moving the Istanbul process uh, forward, headway that, headway that uh, has exceeded all uh, expectations. Uh, it, if you summarize it in, in brief, we started with the concept and now we are in the middle of a process. Uh, and that is a big achievement. But let me briefly refer to some of the steps taken. On the basis of the decision taken in Istanbul in 2011, um, Afghanistan prepared a concept uh, paper which uh, prioritized seven of the 43 uh, confidence building measures CBMs in the political and security, economic and education fields. Thereafter, cons uh, consecutive senior uh, officials meeting in Ashgabat in Turkmenistan, in Kabul, paved the way for uh, the first ministerial follow-up meeting in Kabul on the 14th June this year. The historic meeting uh, brought together 15 heart of Asia countries, 15 ministerial and uh, high-level delegations from supporting countries, as well as 11 high-level delegations from regional and international organizations. As Ambassador uh, Apakan just mentioned, mentioned, the three key outcomes of the conference were as follows. One, political consultations, and as it said, it involves uh, regular meetings at the foreign ministry ministries level. Two, CBM implementation involving a sustained uh, incremental approach to implementation of confidence building measures agreed at the Istanbul conference in November 2011. And three, synergy, as it said, among regional organizations involving uh, par uh, participations of all regional organizations on a single platform with the goal of uh, bringing greater coherence to the various initiatives and in process. I have to say when we speak about regional organizations, it's not about smaller regional organizations. It is about the most important uh, uh, international organizations that are in the region, from NATO to European Union, from Shanghai Cooperation to ECO or SARC and to other, uh, uh, other important organizations. And it, maybe it's one of the rare forum, if, if such a terminology is accepted, where, where the West and East meet, so, or work together, if there is such a thing. 
a unique uh, aspect of uh, the processes that it offers a specific role for all countries, uh, whether participating or supporting members. Each CBM is led uh, or co-led by a specific group of uh, countries working together with a number of supporting countries in regional organizations. Uh, <clears throat> lead countries are responsible for developing specific implementation plans uh, within the framework of uh, regional meetings of uh, technical groups. As one of the co-leads of the CBM on uh, counter-terrorism, the Republic of Turkey graciously hosted, as Ambassador Apakon said, one uh, such meeting earlier this month, um, at which the first draft of the counter-terrorism CBM implementation plan was considered. The next meeting uh, will be hosted by the United Arab Emirates in the upcoming weeks. Additional meetings uh, concerning the other relevant CBMs will be held in the coming weeks and months. The outcome of all uh, regional technical groups meetings entailing a number of implementation uh, plans for each, each CBM uh, will be evaluated uh, uh, during uh, periodic meetings of senior officials, the first of which will take place on the, on the 24th uh, this month, September, uh, during the high level week here in New York. Uh, and uh, the participants might have received the, 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 parts, the, the invitation uh, already. The next uh, Heart of Asia ministerial uh, follow-up meeting will take place, in, take place in Astana, Kazakhstan, in the first half of 2013. Uh, we thank our Kazakh brothers for their uh, gracious hosting of the conference. Distinguished uh, colleagues, uh, participants, uh, ambassadors, uh, I'd like to uh, make one more uh, uh, point before concluding. And working for a successful outcome of the Istanbul process, uh, the countries of heart of Asia, we underscore the need for international support of our efforts on the way forward. We stand ready to work with all our friends and partners in the region and beyond for stability and prosperity. And I would be remiss if I failed to reiterate our thanks to the government of Turkey for its role in helping to launch this important process. Uh, uh, Afghanistan is increasingly going to play an, a central role in this process. But uh, from where we are coming, uh, uh, it would be very difficult without the support of all countries there, especially Turkey, to take it forward and, and to turn it into a real workable process. So we are very thankful for all supports, particularly uh, the support of, of our friend country, Turkey. The Afghan people uh, are uh, grateful to their Turkish brothers and sisters uh, and uh, for your solidarity and support, sir. I thank you, and I have to stop here. Thank you very much, Ambassador Tan. Very, uh, very informative, and we appreciate it. So, Keith, it's over to you. Thank you very much. And thank you, Ambassador Apkin and Ambassador Tanin, and Ambassador Quinn, for the opportunity to, to join you today. Uh, I thought I might take my time just to provide a little more context about the Istanbul process in within the wider uh, situation of regional cooperation uh, around Afghanistan and, and the region more generally. Um, as Ambassador Quinn mentioned, CIC has been working closely with the Afghan government as well as the Norwegian government to support efforts to promote regional cooperation around Afghanistan. And much of the work over the past year has really concentrated both on the preparation for the Istanbul process, but also the outcome, uh, the Istanbul conference, but also the, the ensuing process. And so from, with that kind of body of work in mind, I thought might make uh, do three things. First, make some general observations about regional cooperation uh, in this context. 
And second, try and highlight some of the uh, the promise of the Istanbul process given given this context. And finally, uh, point to some of the challenges or some of the real defining factors that will will shape much of uh, the outcome of the process itself. So first, as, as Ambassador Tanin uh, mentioned, the Istanbul process exists in a very crowded arena. There are numerous, numerous existing regional sub-organizations, planning meetings, coordination sessions, both specific to the region, but also that involve many of the members in the re in, that are part of the heart of Asia. And these span various economic security sectors. By, by our own inventory of, and account, up to 115 different initiatives broadly fall under the, the heading of, that could support the Istanbul process itself. But what's, what's striking about the, the context in which this you know, crowded arena really exists is one in which existing cooperation is largely clustered, a lot of the, uh, clustered around sub-organizations, sub-regions, uh, sub whether it be South Asia with SARC, Central Asia with CSO, or the Greater Middle East with ECHO. Consequently, I think that's, that's indicative of this sort of, this sub-regionalization of, of cooperation um, as being a general aversion within, amongst many of the participants in the heart of Asia for large multilateral settings. Instead, you see a concentration of bilateral, trilateral, quadrilateral, quadrilateral discussions. Yet, in those efforts to really bridge some of those divides and develop more regional, uh, broadly regional cooperation, have largely been confined to economic discussions, as you see with the Central Asian Regional Economic Cooperation Frameworks of CARIC, or the most recently with the fifth Congress of the, uh, or the fifth meeting of the Regional Economic Cooperation Conference. The, the vision in which the common ground that does exist in the region for cooperation is largely seen as one of, of mutual benefit, right, in largely economic terms. Consequently, the, the existing initiatives that, that we do see in the region often are of, of limited scope. Uh, the capacity, for example, in disaster management is, I think it was illustrated with the, in the floods uh, that affected Kashmir in 2005, or the, I'm sorry, the earthquake in 2005, or the floods in 2010. It was largely an international cooperative uh, mechanism, humanitarian response, as opposed to a regional one that responded. And part of, that, part of this aversion towards larger multilateral uh, cooperative frameworks and uh, derives from existing divisions within the, within the region, particularly around key pressing issues and a lack of consensus about the nature and the, the common threat that terrorism poses, counter narcotics as well, as well as different conceptions about what kind of economic opportunities really exist in the region. So within that framework of, within that context of a very crowded uh, arena of cooperative initiatives, but also one that's very divided across, across geographic and uh, political lines, I think the, the promise of the Istanbul process is, is really, uh, can be seen in threefold. One, the ambition of the political scope to link, to form this heart of Asia. And uh, the heart of Asia itself is to, to bring together the greater Middle East, Central Asia, South Asia, Asia Pacific, around a common agenda. Second, you know, following, following the Istanbul conference, the very idea that this is a consultative process, this is a, an iterative discussion that will continue across various participants, instead of being either a single meeting or a, a, a centralized, institutionalized body, but rather something much more far-reaching that can find a common ground, despite these, these various, various differences and, and uh, uncertain agendas. And finally, the the prospect of making this, this, pr this process Afghan-centric um, is one of which you know, Afghanistan is member to many of the existing regional organizations and initiatives, and as evidenced by the recent admission as, to observer status in the SCO this past year. But to ground, to ground the, uh, the Istanbul process within uh, Afghan and Turkish leadership really helps establish a base and, a, and an imperative in which I think to, to push the process forward. So with that, with that in mind, the, it's clear that there are a few, a few major topics which could be for discussion to follow that really have uh, clear implications for the outcome of the Istanbul process within this context. One is, at this stage, there's a balance that, that, that is being struck and being negotiated between the very technical, complex nature of, of 
striking of the implementing developing agendas for the confidence building measures, but also the political momentum that's necessary to drive this process forward. At this stage, it's clear that the Istanbul process has a degree of consensus such that many, many of the more reluctant partners in the region uh, feel a certain cost to not participate and not engage, as evidenced by the, the, the various lead nations that have, that have taken up individual CBMs following the, the, meeting in, uh, the ministerial meeting in Kabul in June. But this, there's a balance to be struck between the technical complexity of developing a common agenda and uh, ambition, along with the political benefits around which a larger framework for cooperation will develop. Second, there's considerable attention and considerable anticipation right now in Afghanistan, because as, as the Istanbul process is developing, it's, it's also developing in a context of the, of the transition process in Afghanistan, and also to follow the transformation decade and it's given given that kind of attention, that kind of that kind of scrutiny about the end of the current international uh, combat mission in Afghanistan, but also Afghan Afghanistan uh, consolidating its sovereignty in the decade after 2015. The the amount of work to be done to really convince more reluctant partners around that are part of the heart of Asia about the potential of the Istanbul process will be essential to developing more robust to, to transform confidence building measures into a more robust. Uh, cooperative framework. And finally, uh, to build on something that Ambassador Quinn uh, mentioned in the, in the beginning of, of her remarks, that regionalism is, is, uh, is a tall, tall order. And it's something that, ex that spans various, various sectors. And at this point, the Istanbul process has developed a very, a very robust and sophisticated and also ambitious uh, vision for, for uh, cooperation. But the, the challenge and ultimately the, the, the success of the Istanbul process, I think, will be measured by its ability to, to broaden and really involve larger sectors. You know, think to think about finding a space for civil society amongst the heart of Asia to develop and cooperate and substantiate the, the kinds of linkages that, that will have to undergird any kind of regional uh, process. It will be essential to the, to the ultimate uh, durability and success of the Istanbul process. So I think with that, with that said, I may hand it back to you, Ambassador Quinn, for, for questions, and thank you. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Keith, uh, provi for providing us with uh, that uh, perspective. Uh, very much uh, appreciated. So um, uh, before I open it up uh, for questions, I just have uh, uh, one or two myself. So I'd like to turn first to uh, you, both you, uh, Ambassador, Apican and Ambassador Tannen, just to ask about, can you differentiate the, or talk a little bit about the, there's the role of governments uh, in this process, but uh, the, you know, the, the business element, so uh, talk about what, what's the role of businesses, and then also, is there a role for civil society? And uh, if you could talk about that a little, a little bit, thank you. Do you want to start, Ambassador Tannen, with that? Um, Ambassador Tannen. Okay. Yes. Uh, among the um, seven CBMs that's identified, or, or the, the seven CBMs that um, uh, per prioritized out of 43, uh, it, uh, it, it includes uh, disaster management, CBM, counterterrorism, uh, counter narcotics, chamber of commerce, commercial uh, opportunities, regional infrastructure, and education. Uh, as you said, it is still, uh, we are just at, at the beginning of a process. Uh, maybe more thoughts are needed how to, how to turn this process into, uh, into a full participatory by all elements that can have uh, a big role within the framework of regional cooperation. Uh, but in there are areas where civil society or some elements of the civil society would play an important role, as uh, the Chamber of Commerce, as you mentioned, but as well as uh, education and culture. Uh, there are, we see role for women and for the vibrant civil society not emerging in my country, but the civil society in uh, South and Central and West Asia that are part of that in Euro-Asia. Uh, 
and so far it has been mainly governmental uh, ministerial two ministerial meetings and then uh, of course we had uh, this two senior official meetings that uh, includes the representative of 15 countries that are represent that are member 15 countries that support and also there are a big number of international uh, organizations including uh, the organizations that are uh, part of the UN where I think through these organizations the civil society express its uh, its presence but maybe we have to take uh, this point not as a question but as an issue that we have to look at look into it uh, broadly um, the, the the one other question just before I open up to the audience would be about the participation of, of regional organizations um, and how they uh, are participating and uh, you know this this I think this is actually something that is uh, it seems to me to be a very new element uh, in this cooperation uh, in this type of cooperation in uh, to br bring in the region together but also bringing regional organizations uh, to cooperate so uh, my question specifically and maybe I'll turn to Keith is do you see a, a comparable mechanism uh, that you might mention uh, that would help us understand how this works and then uh, maybe uh, if there uh, I think perhaps Ambassador Tannen again come back to you about the role of the regional organizations so maybe Keith I could start with you Thank you. I, one of the big changes in the evolution since the initial Istanbul conference in November is a recognition that there are various models, various uh, allies, various analogous institutions that could contribute to the Istanbul process. And as Ambassador Tony mentioned, the vision is not to supersede existing structures, but rather to incorporate and to, to create bridges across. Um, and that's, I think the value of it is is not only to provide models of what kind of what kind of cooperation could be could follow, what kind of uh, examples could could inform and accelerate really, and ensure the delivery of uh, some positive outcome from the Istanbul process, but also to to provide a political basis in which to demonstrate that amongst again more reluctant partners in the or, you know that there is that there is a space in which cooperation can begin to flourish and, and unfold. Um, so I think that both the technical potential of of existing regional um, initiatives, along with the, the political basis, um, is one of the primary contributions that these kind of uh, initiatives have to offer the Istanbul process. Ambassador Tanner, do you want anything? Uh, if, if I add anything, uh, it, the Istanbul process is, uh, appeared to be unique uh, uh, in, in the way the way that it's emerged, uh, that bringing big countries in, in that important part of the world, like uh, Russia and, and China and India, and also important uh, our important uh, neighbors, uh, Turkey. Um, but at the same time, I, I think it's about the regions that are uh, uh, that cannot be seen only in economic terms, whether it's Middle East or Central Asia or South Asia. It should be seen also in terms of, uh, uh, of uh, how uh, this challenge of terrorism uh, is, uh, is, exists, counter-narcotics, and the need, I mean, the, the political challenges that all these countries face and we are trying to see how uh, cooperation can can substitute as a process uh, uh, rivalries or uh, or uh, uh, to to see how how this uh, uh, this process uh, would uh, help us to move towards a, 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 a framework of cooperation that is that is, in principle, everybody agree that is important and essential for the future of the, that region and that part of the world. The only similar uh, experience, I mean, if you see any, any s similar structure, I uh, would like to compare that, possibly is uh, um, the process which led to the creation of organization of security cooperation of Europe. It was, uh, of course, a process started during the Cold War, 
and went through different phases, and it was global enough and not uh, 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 as regional as we uh, see this process. But, uh, but there are many similarities on the way that this, uh, the, the organization was and, and, and the process was, was taking uh, a route and the organization was formed. And uh, I think it was uh, answering the other parts of the question that uh, I, I just would like to say, see that, uh, say, say again that it's not a substitute to any other organizations, but also we have to see any other regional organizations that are now part of that process, they are based on an, a concrete objective, whether it is eco uh, economic cooperation organization or SARC, uh, they are well defined for, I mean, and well established for the concrete uh, objectives uh, in Shanghai cooperation or NATO or European Union that, that are part of that. But when you go to the, the, the regional organizations, Mainly they are economic, or they, they frame one or another uh, form of cooperation. We have some trilaterals on counterterrorism. We have other efforts on counter narcotics. We have these many forms of economic cooperation. But here we are. Uh, uh, I think these efforts can complete what what the Istanbul process is uh, is trying to do. Did you want to add something, Ambassador? Yes. Um, I, I, I fully agree with Ambassador Tanin's uh, uh, remarks on the process. I think this is a political process, and it has its own merits. I think that there is no, maybe it's a little bit difficult to compare with other organizations and with other processes. I think it's good to see that the process is moving with some concrete steps. The point of departure is to enhance dialogue, communication between the regional countries and to increase the regional identity and to acknowledge the need for regional cooperation. And in that context, you know, the Istanbul process is moving through an incremental uh, approach and uh, these CBMs are addressing to specific needs. And the countries of the region are, are, are cooperating. And there are some concrete results. And this is, uh, I could say, and I will repeat, uh, creates more understanding, more dialogue, and uh, not only divergences, but the countries of the region are uh, sh showing and are demonstrating that, that there are places and there's room for convergences and for progress in cooperation. In that context, uh, I could say that regional identity is growing. This is a positive thing, and that would be helpful to the countries of the region, even to the wider, uh, uh, wider Asia. You know, this is a critical and strategical location. There are many uh, major stakeholders. The process within Afghanistan, internal process is going on, the constitutional, the political process. At the same time, regional countries are trying to be helpful to Afghanistan, but the ownership rests with Afghanistan, Afghan people and the Afghan government. Well, thank you very much. I think that really provides uh, an excellent introduction to have a dialogue with uh, all of you. And so I'm going to open up uh, the floor to questions. Uh, now, just uh, a couple of things. Please uh, introduce yourselves. Tell us who you're with. I'll probably take uh, one or two together. I'll hold the mic steady because we are webcasting. And just uh, so you know, Ambassador Apican regret regrettably has to leave at 2.30. So when he has to leave, uh, he, he will uh, just uh, go ahead and leave. So anyhow, thank you very much. And we have two questions in the second row and then Jeff Lorenzi. Thank you. 
Um, Shazia Rafi from Parliamentarians for Global Action. Um, I just had a question really to both Ambassador Apakan and Ambassador Tanin. In terms of how you see the process uh, evolving, you both talked about it as a political process. And so far, uh, the role of parliamentarians and parliaments meeting on an inter-parliamentary basis parallel to this uh, could be an interesting uh, leg forward. It's not civil society because it is the legislative branch of government. Uh, several of them are part of um, international parliamentary bodies. At the same time of the 15 countries, nine of them have elected parliaments. Um, others have uh, consultative shuras or appointed assemblies, but still with a role. So in terms of strengthening the future of security and stability in Afghanistan, where in a certain sense, a functioning representative parliament is a key in any country to establishing that, and the host is an elected um, parliament, it would be a very interesting um, item to add early in the process rather than later. And then in terms of topics, I would suggest if, as you include new topics that the role of justice uh, be added um, as you look at the future because some of what has led to uh, these movements of extremists initially was them coming in and meeting out sort of very rough uh, horrible justice, not quite what I would call justice anyway. So I'd be interested in your comments on that. Uh, Jeff Laurenti with the Century Foundation. I've been struck in the conversation so far, we haven't yet heard the word war. I mean, and there is a war going on in Afghanistan. And we know that Istanbul is not a peacemaking process per se, but as Ambassador Afakan says, it is a political process, and one would think that uh, so long as a war is going on uh, and is not resolved, that there can only be so much success out of the Istanbul uh, effort. So I wonder if the members of the panel could comment, since so many of the, the countries involved in the region have had favorite horses inside Afghan politics, either in some cases on the insurgent side, in other cases within the legal uh, political system, uh, what kind of measures uh, countries are undertaking to try to push along a peacemaking process, and what kind of agreement among them there is on everybody holding hands against interference to continue uh, the war, and with particular reference maybe to the one country that the Americans are most allergic to, Iran, on Afghanistan's western side. Uh, how does that fit in to, onto the political side of this? So I think uh, uh, we'll maybe turn first to Ambassador Apican and then uh, Ambassador Tannen. You can take the questions as you see fit. Thank you. Well, thank you for the questions, and uh, they are very pertinent. I think, uh, I do believe that people-to-people -people relationship and parliaments-to-parliaments -parliaments will be helpful in this process. So uh, this will be helpful to, to achieve uh, some type of uh, rapprochement between the countries. At the end of the day, I believe the countries of region, the people, they are friendly to each other. And parliamentarians could uh, find a useful role uh, building bridges between the countries of the region. And maybe at one stage, I'm not very much familiar with the parliamentarian dimension of it, but we could at this process, of course, it's up to the uh, Afghan government, this process to Istanbul, I mean this dimension, parliamentary dimension to this process after having some consultations. I'm thinking loudly and personally, but thank you for the remark and reminding us the role of parliamentarians and parliaments in political cultural processes. I think even here in UN, we need the contributions, I do believe, contributions of parliamentarians to this intergovernmental work. So this is a pertinent point. 
Well, with regard to the political process, I tried to describe the process because it's between the governments. That's the reason we say intergovernmental and political process. But for example, one of the issues is related to security. It's about counterterrorism. I think this is important for the countries of the region to cooperate in the field of counterterrorism. And there are, you know, also some promising areas such as education, such as women, such as disaster management, and others. They are very related to the, I mean, uh, the daily life of the societies, you know, uh, uh, of the region. So I do believe that this is a process. Yes, we have the problems, rivalries, Maybe you describe it as a war. Yes, we have it. But at the same time, we are searching for a positive agenda within the neighbors in order to cooperate with Afghanistan more. I think this is doable. This is achievable. In order, because when you look at the roots of any uh, military confrontation or others, many factors could play uh, some role. So if we could get an environment of confidence, an environment of uh, cooperation, more cooperative agenda, more positive agenda between the neighboring countries, I think that, that at the end would make a positive impact on Afghanistan. Maybe this is the, uh, not maybe, this is the wish of Afghan government. And I personally believe this is the expectation of the Afghan people. They look to their neighbors for more cooperation. Because this is a big region. They wish to see at the end of the day, a vision for themselves. But this vision could be articulated with regional cooperation. One country cannot draw up a vision for them. So you can make the visions, future visions, infrastructure, economy, uh, political interaction, cultural interaction, only after speaking to your neighbors. And neighbors should have a common mindset for, for being uh, helpful to Afghanistan and having a positive uh, I will repeat it, agenda as neighbors and for Afghanistan. Thank you. Ambassador uh, Ted. I just uh, support what, uh, I mean, Ambassador Pakon said on, on the role of parliament and civil society. You, it's an idea we have to focus on. Coming to the, this uh, question of um, Mr. Laurenti, uh, for if we talk about peace in Afghanistan, uh, we and, and you are uh, you have been involved yourself in uh, this and uh, into the, the the Century Foundation in providing us with a big report about reconciliation. Uh, we know that there are three at least three elements for for a settlement or for a political solution. That is reconciliation, and that's regional cooperation, and that's the international community's involvement and support. Uh, so through this uh, uh, Stumble process or countries of heart of Asia, for the first time we are moving towards a, a situation or, or we, we are establishing a framework to realize the regional cooperation. Not only uh, in, in, in uh, benefiting from uh, and the economic opportunities in the region and how Afghanistan can bridge these regions as an as a, as a economic land bridge, but also dealing with terrorism, with counter-narcotics, also re reconciliation. So this framework is getting us, taking us somewhere where uh, this uh, ops idea of uh, uh, idea of uh, uh, of regional cooperation. Uh, around building a, a peaceful situation, not only in Afghanistan, but in the whole region, right? That, that can uh, have a meaning and that can be realized. 
But I would like also to, to share here some of the views that, uh, uh, that uh, of course, there is a, uh, there is a, there is a look, there is a different look into the war. Uh, there is not a war in Afghanistan where uh, uh, two sides are uh, fighting and we are waiting to see who is going to win. And it is not such a situation. I think uh, there is an insurgency, the terrorist uh, activities and insurgency uh, that is threatening the peaceful uh, development of not only Afghanistan, but the whole region. And it is not a war in terms of two sides, right? In such a situation, you cannot wait to see when the war can, can end. I mean, this, uh, the kind of wars we face in Afghanistan and other places, uh, as its economic, uh, political, strategic, psychological components. Uh, and uh, I think the process, like a stumble process, is exactly addressing that complexity of these new wars, right? Uh, this, the French philosopher Michel Foucault talked about the hidden functions uh, of some, uh, 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 are he interested in hidden functions of, of, of uh, policies that, that did not work? For example, he was talking about the prison. He, he called it a detestable uh, uh, factor that one cannot uh, unable to work without. So he didn't like it, but he thought this is what we, we have. So in Afghanistan, I think one of the detestable factors in our region is that there is a terrorist uh, uh, threat with a multi-dimensional terrorist threat, not limited to Afghanistan, but threatening the life and prosperity and, and the future of the whole region. Even big countries are not safe. And you see how this uh, wave is uh, sometimes spreading. For this, I think that we have to have, we should have a complex answer. The complex is not to sit with the enemy only that do the, and on the, and the two sides on the two sides of the table, and it's not very practical. The answer is how to have a kind of inclusive, comprehensive attitude where we should uh, address the roots of that that conflict, if you call it a conflict. Thank you. I want to ask Keith, did you want to add anything in particular, the pol political dialogue uh, aspect of the question, or either question? Just give you the opportunity. Thanks. Uh, two, two quick things. One, um, one, I think it's important to keep in mind the longer arc in which this, the Istanbul process is, is unfolding. And really, the call for regional cooperation and greater, greater uh, Collaboration within the region really has been has been led by Afghanistan for a number of years. I mean, thinking back to the Declaration on on Good Neighborly Relations, which the Afghan Foreign Ministry released in 2002, and and um, but and it's only really since I think the London Conference in 2010 that you begin to see a growing international consensus that some sort of cooperative framework has to be brought to the fold as part of a larger a larger. Um, agenda for, for Afghanistan, but also its surrounding neighbors and so forth. It happens to be a very, a very ambitious one, and, but one that's also, I think, has a very, um, has a long timetable, has a long vision of what can emerge. Um, such that the imperative of the end of the of the transition process in 2014, I think the Istanbul process is clearly operating in that context, right? Part it's part of the urgency of of pushing this agenda forward, but it's not necessarily it's not necessarily limited to. And so, given given the kind of scales and and the scale of issues at play, the rivalries, the divisions, but also the starting point from which the Istanbul process and regional cooperation has developed, um, the the time frame is one in which to link regional cooperation to the search for peace or political settlement in Afghanistan is is um, overestimates what can be achieved, but also the complexity of what is what is facing the region. Can I do it? Just. I mean, 
We, in 1990s, the, the attitude of the region and the macro region towards Afghanistan was how to, in, how to save themselves from the flames of the Afghan war. In 2000, this attitude changed how to work in Afghanistan together uh, for stability and peace. Recently, we have the northern route. Or recently, we have, uh, for the first time, uh, not only during the Cold War, after the Cold War, that the NATO uh, uh, planes can use uh, airports in, in Russia uh, for fueling. And we have bases in Central Asia. So I think everybody has a still, there is a consensus uh, that end of conflict in Afghanistan or peace and stability in Afghanistan is something that all benefit. Right? That, that's, well, uh, that's important. The second thing is, while Iran and uh, in, in the United States are seen uh, what, in whatever way you like to see it and we watch and hear about it, they worked in Afghanistan at the beginning in 2001. They work in Afghanistan to, today together f around the same goals. And in Istanbul process, whatever rivalries um, one can uh, assume about the countries and region or antagonisms and differences, but they were together in Istanbul. Uh, we even, we, 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 we saw how, how that pr pragmatism, pragmatism overcome. And of course, you also played a very important role in bringing this, these thinkings together. So I would like to just to say that uh, it's not about uh, overestimating this potential of cooperation. But uh, seeing the reasons, and of course, uh, also it's about how actively benefit from that potentials towards a better cooperation. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, well, and uh, uh, I would like to add that this is a, a new body of language. It's a, a unique process. I will again uh, underline this point. At the end of the day, uh, I do agree with Ambassador Tani that it's also my personal experience when I was in Turkey. It was difficult for the parties to speak four or five years ago. We have reconciliation process and uh, the process, inner process of Afghanistan. We have international process, UN, and the conferences are building an international process for Afghanistan. At the same time, we need the neighboring countries, the regions, the, the countries of the region, to get together and speak about the future of the region, and in that context also, Afghanistan. So I think that's good to have such a process. I'm not saying it because it's an Istanbul process. But I do believe that in all cases, we need a regional dimension. Regional countries should be helpful to the international dimension, also to the internal dimension. This is the collective responsibility of the neighboring countries. In all cases, whether in Asia or in Middle East or somewhere else, we need regional countries to cooperate and to speak among each other in order to find the solution and to make some advice and recommendation, recommendations to the international community. Thank you. Okay, so opening up the floor again, I see a question in the back of the room. Is there one? Okay, thank you. Please wait on the mic. Uh, my name is Lorna Tychastip. I'm an international communications uh, consultant. I've been most recently working in Iraq. I'm just wondering, um, we've talked, we, you guys have covered, uh, you know, economic cooperation, narcotic, anti-narcotic and anti-terror efforts. I'm wondering if anti-corruption is being addressed at all, given the fact that Afghanistan rates 180 out of 183 on the anti-corruption, on the corruption scale, and 160 out of 183 by the World Bank in the Doing Business Survey. Specifically, trade across borders, they're 179 out of 183. And I've been told that the reasoning behind that is that because customs 
is so corrupt in Afghanistan, international business do, do not, legitimate international businesses do not want to do business in Afghanistan. So is that part of what's being addressed in the Istanbul process? Thank you. Question to me. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, there are 15 countries dealing with issues that are there, the issues of 15 countries. Um, if the corruption is the only issue of Afghanistan, uh, issue for Afghanistan and the whole world, so then Afghanistan should deal with it, and not 15 countries. Uh, but if corruption is a kind of more than Afghan issue, there are countries like Pakistan, Iran, uh, former Soviet Union, uh, I mean, Central Asian countries, Russia, China, and, and others, Saudi Arabia, uh, Emirates. So I think uh, they agree how to, how to define this, identify these uh, CBMs, because it is about how to, to build up around something to cooperate. Of course, uh, 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 the issue of, uh, of, of participation of people, the issue of, of, of strengthening of governance in, in, the, in that region in corruption would be the issues that can be part of this conference buildings. And when it comes to Afghanistan, I would like to say that <coughs> this, uh, this is, uh, uh, this is a, a, a serious issue. Uh, the Afghan, uh, Afghanistan uh, is well aware of, of how to uh, uh, how to responsibly deal with the issue of corruption. We've introduced uh, uh, ourselves a, uh, a mutual accountability framework in Tokyo in July, where the government of Afghanistan and the donor countries uh, agreed that aids can go to Afghanistan. Uh, uh, in, in line with the success of the fight against corruption. Measures are taken. Uh, the Afghan, not only the Afghan government, but the Afghan civil society, media are involved. The international community is, and the representative of the international community is, is are, are very seriously involved in how to help the Afghan government. This debate from last year, if you compare it where it was, it, it, it is taken to a stage where uh, we think that uh, a movement has been initiated and fight against corruption. At the top level, from the president of Afghanistan to, to the cabinet, they are personally involved in that commitment. Of course, uh, the reason in a country where uh, you have these billions of dollars of military expenses, uh, uh, and you have billions of dollars that coming for, uh, for, for uh, uh, development, or uh, uh, also you have uh, uh, this, this aid money and also you have uh, war economy. These wars has one economic component in Sierra Leone and Congo and, uh, and I think in Afghanistan with the drugs. So that the corruption is like, like being grown in that ground, like a bacteria that needs, needs uh, an inducive uh, environment. So I think uh, uh, it's important to see whether the government of Afghanistan is committed or not, doing uh, its bit or not. But it's not only the government of Afghanistan. We wanted the Afghanistan government, the international community, work together to fight with corruption. Because corruption, if the corruption was about the, f the few billion dollars that the Afghan government is receiving, uh, it was easier because everybody could ask the Afghan government to give an account, right? From 10 billion or 20 billion they get. But the Afghan government is not getting all the money. I'm not saying that this the international community, I'm not blaming the international community, anybody else. We are together there. And uh, the system needs to be improved. The work should be, uh, rein each other's work should be reinforced. Uh, when it comes to the regional, I think the, the corruption is uh, an international issue. And when it comes to this uh, heart of Asia, I think heart of Asia is not also free uh, of, of this issue. It should be one of the CBMs. There should be a, a, a collective uh, uh, work, work, uh, and everybody should be part of such a such an effort in the in in 
in, in, in the process that is, that is now uh, being taken forward. Other questions? We, should, we shouldn't end with corruption. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs> um, so my name is uh, Steve Funk, um, a student at New York University. And uh, my question is, what are some of the specific measures you would like to see taken for the future of the Afghanistan country on education within this process? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, education. Yeah, education. Uh, within this. Uh, so the question was the question, yeah. specifics on. Uh, uh, so, like, uh, to be seen in the area of education within this process in Afghanistan. Yes, correct, and, Thank you. and things you would My, like to see, uh, yeah. I guess, specifically from from Turkey or in general within the process for education. I mean, there is a there is a pool of uh, opportunities in this country, and, and, and uh, among the countries that are part of that uh, heart of Asia's group, the Istanbul process. Uh, I think uh, uh, the details uh, of how we can uh, cooperate on education um, uh, still to be determined. Uh, it's one of the, the CBMs. Uh, but what is part of the expectation is, is how to cooperate together on the area of education. Uh, one can assume that it is about uh, joint uh, uh, research projects, uh, granting scholarship, for example, for Afghan students in the region, uh, promoting higher education uh, uh, is uh, one of the high priorities. Uh, and also, we can have a regular meeting, uh, meetings, regular meetings of uh, uh, educa uh, ministries of education uh, to uh, promote best practices uh, for education in the region. Uh, we, uh, I mean, there are uh, uh, a number of bilateral uh, agreements between Afghanistan and, and the countries in the region. Uh, we, we, uh, our neighbors, uh, or they, they increased the scholarship for, for Afghan uh, students. Uh, Pakistan, India, China, uh, among them. And Central Asians also are, are trying to help with our education uh, system. And uh, uh, of course, the, bul the, the bulk of uh, the biggest part is still uh, what the international community in general is trying to help Afghanistan, UNICEF, and, and, and through bilateral uh, Means, but the region, the region, it's part of South-South cooperation. Also, the region has a, has a potential to not only to help Afghanistan, but to think about some bigger shared projects that if that a group of countries or all countries would be able to benefit. Because it's not only these 15 countries there. There are 15 countries that support uh, that are supporting. These are these include the United States, United Kingdom, France. Uh, uh, Germany, Italy, uh, Norway, Denmark, Sweden, uh, uh, France, why is it? Uh, and also Egypt. Uh, so, so if, if I missed uh, any name, but these are the countries that have the ability and the potential to be very, to, to be helpful not only for Afghanistan, but the, for the whole region and, and, and the members of the heart of Asia's countries in the future. So there is a promising prospect. I think. One, one, one byproduct of 10 years, the educational gains have been in, in terms of access and um, number of students that are, that are in schools that you see a demographic pressure now in Afghanistan such that the number of students that are completing primary and secondary school are now looking for opportunities for university and tertiary education. And one, one possibility um, within the Istanbul process is to make, um, to help meet that kind of demand and the shortage of, of seats in, in education in universities around Afghanistan through greater scholarships, through greater um, exchange opportunities overseas. If, if I just add one thing, the biggest achievement in Afghanistan is the biggest number of people enrolled in primary education. 
And, but when you link it to the higher education, there is some, it's one of the things that we have to focus. We don't need only millions of people that can write and uh, read. We need these people, as you said, uh, with the, this, uh, the demographic changes to be part of, of development and, 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 and uh, reconstruction of the country in the future. And here, I think the region, uh, the focus is on higher education and, and, is, uh, and capacity building through uh, higher education. This is what uh, uh, we, we uh, expect from that, that part of uh, CBM. Okay, so I see one more question. Y'all, we're running out of time. This will be our last question. Thank you. Thank you. Leila Nikchu from Parliamentarians for Global Action. Ambassador, where do you see the role of the International Criminal Court in stability and security building in Afghanistan? The ICC has received 56 communications and is looking into the situation of Afghanistan. And how do you see this helpful in the process? Could, could you just uh, uh, repeat your question in terms, because uh, I couldn't catch it either. Um, the role of the International Criminal Court in stability building and security building in Afghanistan. The international, Afghanistan is a state party to the International Criminal Court, and the ICC has received 56 communications and is looking into the situation. Where do you find this helpful? We, uh, we joined the uh, uh, ICC in 2004. Four, I think, yes? Uh, 2002. I mean, I, I, uh, if, if I make a mistake, it is, uh, yeah. it's not because I'm not interested, but uh, it's 2003 or, or four. Uh, I met uh, the representative of I, uh, ICC a few months ago. I'm aware of that there are some, uh, uh, that, that they receive some uh, complaints. Uh, we, uh, justice is a big issue. It has been issue, an, an important issue from day one uh, since uh, uh, the, end, the end of Taliban and the creation of the new establishment of the new government uh, with the help of international community. Uh, we haven't been always, uh, we were not always successful in uh, better balancing this, uh, uh, the, the, the relations or this trade-off between peace and justice. Um, uh, of course, uh, uh, Afghanistan is committed uh, based on its constitution and, and, uh, and that as a party also to all international conventions uh, to uh, bring uh, uh, those who, uh, who who violated the human rights or uh, are accused of uh, of war crimes to justice. Uh, do this process were slow? The more focus, even the UN, the international community focus was on uh, on on peace rather than justice. Uh, the wars that I talk about, not only Afghanistan, is sometimes. Uh, is is uh, not sometime most of the time uh, cre create, uh, created not only in Afghanistan. Look at the African wars, Asian wars, impunity, uh, and uh, and uh, the whole focus was how to end the, this this conflict. But uh, I think we are in process of working uh, with with ICC. Uh, Afghanistan is very, Afghan government is open to look into all these cases and uh, your representative, we, your Afghanistan government received the letter of ICC and I'm sure that uh, the authorities in Kabul will deal with it uh, thoroughly. Well, thank, thank you all very much for participating. I really want to thank uh, our panel today and the opportunity here to uh, co-host with the mission of Turkey and the mission of Afghanistan, Ambassador Abakan who we greatly appreciate having been here but had to leave, Ambassador Tannen, Keith, Dr. Stansky, thank you so much, and really thank you all for participating. <laughs>